Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. Thank you for coming back to another teaching installment of when the temple in heaven is open, everything will change. And today we're going to be taking a look at the story that's found in Judges 9, which is the story of Abimelech, the usurper who ruled over Israel after he had killed his 70 brothers on one stone. And in Judges chapter 9, we have a perfect picture, a perfect type, a perfect shadow of the day of the Lord. And so we're going to see in this story um, the 70 years which we are at currently in our day and age. We're going to see the rising up of the Antichrist. We're going to see the rapture of the church. We're going to see the time of peace that the Antichrist rules for three years, the first half of the tribulation. We're going to see um, the abomination of desolation when the evil spirit comes and the Antichrist declares himself to be God. And then uh, the wars and great destruction starts to happen during the last half of the tribulation. And so we're going to see all these things. Oh, and then we're going to see what this picture shows. Um, at the end of the story, a woman drops a, a giant rock on top of the head of Abimelech and kills him, crushes his skull. So, of course, this is a picture of when Yeshua, Jesus Christ, comes back and he destroys the Antichrist. He's the rock. And he comes and he destroys the Antichrist with the word of his mouth and by the brightness of his coming because he is the precious cornerstone, the tried and true stone. Hallelujah. And his bride is with him. That's the woman. His bride is with him. Hallelujah. We're his bride. We come back riding on white horses with him. So in Judges 9, we see a perfect picture of what is going to happen in the time of the end. So let us get to the teaching. Hallelujah. So here we have Judges 8. So let's get the background. Okay, so Gideon, who had um, delivered Israel out of the hands of Midian, uh, remember that story where God uh, reduced his army and um, they, Gideon and his mighty men uh, defeated the Midianites by the supernatural power of God. And um, after they defeated the Midianites, um, the people of Israel, this is during the time of the judges, they wanted Gideon to rule over them. Uh, but Gideon said, no, I'm not going to rule over you. He says this in verse 22. Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, rule over us, you and your son and your grandson also, for you have saved us from the hand of Midian. Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, and my son will not rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. Okay, so this is during the time of the judges when um, it was a theocracy. It was supposed to be a theocracy with God ruling over the children of Israel. But we see way back here with Gideon that the people were demanding a king. They wanted to be just like the nations, and they tried to set Gideon up to be king, but Gideon would have none of it. Um, he said the Lord was going to rule over you, and he, he said that not even his children were going to rule over the Israelites. But uh, once Gideon dies, that changes. You know, and uh, but Gideon wasn't without his faults because we're all sinners, and uh, this is what um, um, came to be a snare after Gideon died. It says here in verse um, 30, Now Gideon had 70 sons, his own offspring, for he had many wives. Okay, so that, there, therein lies the problem. Okay, Gideon had many wives, and through his many wives he produced 70 sons. And then, he says, uh, verse 31, and then one of his concubines who was in Shechem also bore him a son, and he called his name Abimelech. So he not only had wives, he also had concubines. And the concubine's son, um, who was Abimelech, this would be the one who would rise up after Gideon dies. And so we're going to take a look at that. And we see in verse 33, as soon as Gideon died, the people of Israel turned again and whored after the Baals and made Baal Berit, their God. And the people of Israel did not remember the Lord their God who had delivered them from the hand of all their enemies on every side. 
And they did not show steadfast love to the family of Jerubbabel, that is Gideon, in return for all the good that he had done to Israel. So as soon as Gideon died, the, the same Gideon, um, the mighty man of valor who had subdued the Midianites and gave rest to the children of Israel for 40 years, once he died, the people immediately went and whored again after Baal. And they made Baal Beareth their god. Uh, Baal Beareth, uh, the Hebrew, uh, uh, the, the translation of Baal Beareth is um, Baal of the covenant. Uh, Berit is covenant. Okay, so they made a covenant with death. Okay, and that covenant with death was enforced by Abimelech as we turn to Judges 9. And we see that covenant of death played out again in the end times when the Antichrist takes over um, after the cloudy day. And he enforces the covenant which starts the 70th week of Daniel, the last seven years that are about to be fulfilled. Hallelujah. So let's go to Judges 9. In Judges 9, we start off with uh, the conspiracy by Abimelech. Now, first of all, uh, what does Abimelech mean? Let's, let's take a look at the Hebrew of Abimelech. Hallelujah. Because these words uh, have very deep meaning. These Hebrew words have very deep meaning. Hallelujah. So Abimelech, what's that mean? Father is king. Okay, so Abi, Ab means father, and Melech is king. So his name is Father is King. Well, the interesting thing is that by the actions of Abimelech, he proved that his father, the king that he served, uh, Baal Beareth, uh, the the uh, the false god of the covenant, the covenant of death, his father is the devil. Okay, that's his king, and we see that because Abimelech would go on to slay all seventy of his brothers. So let's read this. Now Abimelech, the son of Jerubbabel, went to Shechem to his mother's relatives and said to them, and to the whole clan of his mother's family, Say in the ears of all the leaders of Shechem, which is better for you, that all seventy of the sons of Jerubbabel rule over you, or that one rule over you? Remember also that I am your bone and your flesh. And his mother's relatives spoke all these words on his behalf in the ears of all the leaders of Shechem. And their hearts inclined to follow Abimelech, for they said, He is our brother. And they gave him seventy pieces of silver out of the house of Baal Beareth. Remember, that's uh, the god of the covenant. Baal, the false god, Beareth is the covenant, with which Abimelech hired worthless and reckless fellows who followed him. So the leaders of Shechem um, gave to Abimelech uh, seventy pieces of silver for um, the seventy sons of Jerubbabel. So each silver piece represented one of Jerubbabel's sons. Jerubbabel is a Gideon. And he hired, Abimelech went to go and hire worthless and reckless fellows who followed him. So Abimelech, uh, who his father uh, is the king, his father the king, uh, his father the devil, Okay, his name is Abimelech, which means father is king. So by his actions right here, he's demonstrating that he serves Hasatan. Because we know that the Bible tells us that um, the devil is a murderer from the beginning. Okay, uh, the devil is a murderer from the beginning. And so Abimelech, by his actions, he hired worthless and reckless fellows who followed him. And they went to his father's house at opera and killed his brothers the sons of Jerubbabel, 70 men on one stone. Okay, so Abimelech's actions right off the top demonstrate that he served the devil. He got the money from the house of Baal Bereth. He, he got his money from um, the house of Satan, uh, where the covenant of death is located at. And uh, with the covenant of death, with the blood money, he uh, one silver piece for each of his 70 brothers, he uh, went and had worthless fellows um, follow him and kill each and every one of his brothers, okay, except for one, because we read this in uh, at the end of verse 5, but Jotham, the youngest son of Jerubbabel, was left, for he hid himself, okay, so here we see a picture of the rapture, 
well, let's go back to the 70, the 70 men. Okay, so 70 men, 70 pieces of silver. It's obvious that God is pointing us to the number 70. Okay, uh, we know in uh, our day and age that Israel just celebrated its 70th anniversary um, on May 14th, uh, 2018. It was the 70th anniversary since they uh, declared themselves to be a sovereign nation on May 14th, 1948. And then we know that um, the Bible tells us to learn uh, the parable of the fig tree. Okay, uh, Matthew 24, verse 32. Um, Jesus didn't tell us to read this. He didn't tell us um, to, um, uh, to just look at this. He said, learn. You have to learn this lesson. Uh, verse 32, from the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see all these things, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So in accordance with what Jesus tells us to do about learning the parable of the fig tree, we have to know that when we start to see the fig, okay, the fig tree is Israel, uh, the fig tree is Israel. So when we start to see that the fig tree is starting to blossom, it's putting forth its leaves, its branches are becoming tender, it's about to bear fruit, we're to know that summer is near. Okay, so uh, he likens uh, knowing that summer is near to a generation who sees all these things come to pass. He says this generation will not pass who sees it. The generation who sees the fig tree starting to blossom will not pass away until everything takes place. And everything is the final week of Daniel. Uh, remember, uh, Daniel chapter 9 tells us that uh, 70 sevens are determined upon um, the people of Israel. Okay. And for the first 483 um that has been fulfilled the first 483 um years of the 77s uh which is actually 69 69 weeks um 69 weeks times 7 uh that has been fulfilled which equals 483 years but there's one more week left and that last 7 let me go to it that last seven is when um, the covenant of death will be signed by the Antichrist. And that last seven is the time of Jacob's trouble. When uh, the Antichrist appears after the day of the Lord has begun and Babylon the Great is destroyed, Gog and Magog is defeated, uh, the whole world is made into a desolate wilderness, everything... Um, Every tower has fell to the ground. All the islands have been moved out of their places. The mountains um, have been leveled. Everything has been rocked um, to its foundation because God came down upon the clouds just like he came down upon Mount Sinai and he shook the whole world. And at the same time, he raptured his church. And at the same time, he sent terrible judgment to begin uh, the terrible day of the Lord. Uh, and so from the ashes of that, here comes the one who has the covenant of death, Baal Beareth, okay, the Antichrist who makes a covenant, okay, he, he shall make a strong covenant, okay, the strong covenant is, is the, is the Berit, the same, uh, the same Hebrew word that we found in Judges chapter 8, okay, what's, uh, here we go, covenant, Berit, okay, Berit, hallelujah. Berit means covenant. Berith. Okay, that's the same word that we saw back here in Judges. Okay, when uh, Gideon died, the people whored after Baal and and made uh, Baal Berith their god. Baal Berith. Okay, it's the same word, Berith. It means covenant. Baal of the covenant. Baal Berith. Okay, that's the same thing that's going to happen in, in our days. Okay, the people... Um, after the Lord shakes everything up on the cloudy day, um, the light has gone out in the world because 
the rapture has happened. The church has been removed. Okay, there, there, there's no more light during that time. Okay, um, it's the night when no one can work. And so uh, here comes the Antichrist with no one to oppose him except, I'll, I'm going to get to this teaching in the, later in the lesson, but there's going to be uh, only two lights during this time. And those two lights will be coming from Jerusalem uh, through the two witnesses. Okay, um, but that's it. So the Antichrist is going to reign and rule with, with impunity uh, for the first uh, half of the tribulation. And he confirms his rulership with this covenant, this covenant of death that he makes with um, specifically Israel, uh, which allows them to rebuild the temple on, on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And once this treaty is signed, um, the countdown of the 2,520 days begins at the moment that this covenant of death is signed. And so we see here, um, back to Judges 9 and Abimelech, that um, the number 70 is highlighted twice. The 70 sons that were killed and the 70 pieces of silver pointed us to the time of the end that we're in now. The 70 year anniversary has just passed. Um, we know Psalm 90 verse 10 says that a generation, uh, the years of our life are 70 or even by re reason of strength 80, yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. And so since the time of David, a generation is likened to 70 years. And if we have some strength, they might be 80. But we know that uh, the 70 years have just passed, so what we're going into now is the time of the trouble, the time of toil and trouble, okay? Because everything after the 70 years is going to be uh, the tribulation, okay? The tribulation, which is going to be nothing but toil and trouble, okay? that Those last seven years is toil and trouble for everyone who's left behind. It's the day of wrath, okay? The day of great judgment, okay? And so... Um, we also see that they had the 70 pieces of silver, which represents um, the 70th week of Daniel. Okay, two 70s are, are highlighted in this story to point our attention um, to something greater that God is trying to convey. Remember, there are so many things that God is saying in his word um, because he's always speaking on multiple levels at the same time. This is the word of God is infinite. OK, this this is the word of God. He's he's speaking on so many levels and there's just so much in depthness, you know, and we're just scratching the surface. There's just so much, you know, you know, going to the Hebrew and looking at the Hebrew words, the individual letters. I mean, uh, the gematria, it, 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 it's just so many levels that God is speaking on because he's God. But he wants us to uh, dig it out. He wants us to be like uh um, uh, wise uh, uh, kings who, who search for treasures in his word uh, because he's made us a kingdom of priests. Uh, 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 we're, we're kings and priests and, and we're, we're supposed to search out his word for uh, these gems and jewels that he has embedded in his word. Hallelujah. And so God gets our attention to the time that we are living in now. The 70 year anniversary has past and now the 70th week will come and when the 70th week comes Abimelech comes Abimelech the Antichrist okay Abimelech is a type and shadow of the Antichrist but oh yeah one of the youngest brothers of Jerubbabel was left and he for he hit himself so one of the brothers of um of Abimelech uh, escaped okay so this represents the church okay this represents uh, uh, the escape of the church, okay? Uh, Jotham, look at what his name means. Hallelujah. His, his name means the Lord is perfect. Let's, let me show you this. Uh, Jotham. Uh, praise the Lord. Jotham. Hallelujah. Here we go. His name means, yes, the Lord is perfect. Hallelujah. So his name means that the Lord is perfect. Hallelujah. You see, the same type of deliverance is going to happen for the body of Christ when um, the enemy, when the devil, when he, he tries to stand before uh, the woman 
who, who's about to give birth and to devour the child. Uh, just like um, Abimelech, uh, he tried to stand before um, all, all the sons of Gideon and, and devour each and every one of Gideon's uh, uh, sons. Uh, but he wasn't able to get all of them. Uh, just like uh, 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 the devil, he won't be able to get the body of Christ. That, that's in Revelation 12. Look at it. Revelation 12 tells us that the devil, he's going to try to do the same thing. Uh, he's going to try to do the same thing. He's going to try to, to devour um, the body of Christ, but he can't do it. Um, and the dragon, verse, uh, verse 4, Revelation 12, and the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. That's the same thing that Abimelech tried to do. But Abimelech couldn't get to Jotham because the Lord is perfect, which means that God is always an infinite amount of steps ahead of the enemy. Okay, he, 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 There is no counsel, no might, no understanding against the Lord. He's the Almighty. He is the Most High. Okay, he, he's the king of kings. OK, he, he, he's the one who knows it all from uh, the beginning. OK, and so here we see that the dragon is defeated again. And so verse five, she, she gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Uh, but her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Hallelujah. You see, so the body of Christ is caught up to God and to his throne when um, the cloudy day comes. OK, uh, the enemy, he won't be able to get the body of Christ, just like the enemy wasn't able to get all the sons of um, Gideon here. Uh, Jotham escaped for he hid himself. And we see uh, the same invitation in Isaiah uh, 26. Isaiah 26 talks about the same hiding um, when um, our king comes to do judgment upon the earth. Uh, Isaiah 26 uh, verse 20. Come, my people, into your chambers and shut your doors behind you. Hide yourself for a little while until the fury has passed by. For behold, the Lord is coming from his place to punish uh, the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity, and the earth will disclose the bloodshed on it and will no more cover its lane. So this is the same invitation when uh, the body of Christ is caught up. In, into the throne room of God, into the Father's house. We enter into our chambers. We enter into the uh, the third heaven, Mount Zion, and we shut the doors behind us. And we're hidden, just like Jotham was hidden, uh, because the Lord is perfect. Okay, so here we see another uh, shadow of the rapture of the church. Anybody who says that there's no pre-tribulation pre rapture, I mean, I don't know what Bible they're reading. Over and over and over again. God continues to demonstrate that he will save his own from a time of trouble. Look at this time of trouble. Abimelech, you know, his you know, he 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 was uh he was hell-bent on ruling over Israel. He wanted to eliminate all of his brothers. And he he killed 70 of them. But because God is in control, he let one of them escape, Jotham. Okay, because the Lord is perfect. He allowed one of them to escape and he hid himself from the wrath of Abimelech. This was because God did it. Okay, this is God who's going to save his body. Okay, we just read it in Revelation 12. The enemy's going to try to do the same thing that Abimelech did here. He's going to try to devour the child that's going to be born, but he can't do it because the child is caught up unto God and to his throne. We're taken up into the father's house on the cloudy day. We're taken out of the world. We're taken to the place that Jesus Christ promised to take us to. He said he would come again and he would take us to be where he was at. Hallelujah. I mean, you either believe what the Bible says or you make up your own uh, fanciful theories, which are utterly defeated every time when you actually read and study the word of God. OK, you don't even have to go two pages into the Bible to see the story of Enoch and how Enoch was uh, translated before the flood. OK, Enoch walked with God and uh, God took Enoch because he walked with him. That's the same thing that's going to happen with the church. I mean, I mean, there are just so many examples in the word of God of how God will save his own from the time of trouble and hide them. OK, when the trouble comes and the same promise is given to the church. Hallelujah. The church in Philadelphia has promised to be kept from the hour of trial. Hallelujah. And those who are watching and praying will be accounted worthy 
to escape all the things that are about to come on the earth and to stand before the Son of Man, as the author Luke tells us in his gospel. You know, it's just so many different places that the rapture is mentioned that it would be exhaustive to go through all of the teachings in this lesson because I can't do that. I'm trying to get through this, and we're only on verse 5. But here again, here's more evidence, okay? Another evidence for the pre-tribulation rapture in a type and shadow by the youngest son, Jotham, which means the Lord is perfect, how he was hid during the time of Abimelech's wrath. Okay, he was hid, he was taken, he was hidden from the wrath of the serpent, just like the church will be. Hallelujah. And so let's continue to read. Okay, so now Abimelech is made leader over Israel. And we see this in verse 6. And all the leaders of Shechem um, came together and all Beth Milo, and they went and made Abimelech king by the oak of the pillar at Shechem. Now, the interesting thing about Shechem. It was this was the first place that is mentioned um, way, 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 way back when Abraham first came into the promised land. Uh, and this is in Genesis chapter 12, verse 6. We read about this here, uh, Shechem. Uh, this place is first mentioned in connection with Abraham's journey from Haran at the Oak of Moray. In the vicinity, he reared his first altar to the Lord in Palestine. Genesis 12, 6. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree at Moreh, at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. So we see that it's interesting how this story takes place in Shechem, uh, the same place where God first brought the progenitor of the nation of Israel, Abraham, um, um, too, when he journeyed from his um, land that God told him to leave from, when he, he journeyed from Ur of the Chaldees and he came all the way to a land that he didn't even know where he was going. And the first place mentioned is Shechem when, he, when Abraham arrived there. And here we see that Abimelech, which means, uh, you know, which is a symbol for the Antichrist, he's made king during this time of the judges in Judges chapter 9 um, in, the, in Shechem. Okay, so this is telling us that this is a deeper story, a, a deeper story of who will rule over the promised land. Okay, uh, God gave the promised land to Abraham. Okay, but in the end times, um, we see that um, the controversy will be played out again because remember, um, uh, the end times is all about the nation of Israel. It's, it's the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, who is going to rule over the promised land? Will the promises of God be fulfilled, which they will be? Okay, God is perfect. <laughs> but the enemy, you know, somehow in his twisted and demented mind, he thinks that he can still win. And so what he's going to try to do in the end times is bring up this ancient controversy. Uh, you know, he, he thinks that he will rule um, Israel and, 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 and in doing so uh, nullify um, the promises of God, uh, because uh, if he could kill all uh, Israel, if he could kill every single Jew, um, well, then the promises of God will not be made right. OK, the promises of God would would fail. And that means that God would be a liar because God said that uh, he's not going to come again until um, the remnant of Israel cries out. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. And so what the enemy is going to try to do in the last days during the time of Jacob's trouble is he, he's going to gather all of Israel. But it's really God who's gathering all of Israel. But, you know, the Antichrist, he's going to appear. You know, he's going to tell the Jews he's going to appear as their savior. He's going to tell the Jews to rebuild your temple, you know, and the Jews are going to accept him as a, as a messianic figure. And he's going to gather all the Jews back to the promised land so that he could try to kill them all. Okay, so if he if the Antichrist could kill them all, uh, um, that means that no one will be able to cry out that uh, Yeshua is Lord. None of the Israelites will be able to cry out that Yeshua is Lord like Yeshua said that they would when he comes again. But we know that um, during the uh, middle of the tribulation, um, during the middle of the tribulation, the Bible tells us that uh, the nation of Israel will 
escape to the wilderness, those who recognize the abomination of desolation and they flee um, to the mountains. When they see that, Yeshua said they have to run right away, can't look back, can't take anything out the house, can't grab anything. You got to go straight away and um, flee into the wilderness. Hallelujah. Um, but we know that, hallelujah, that God is still on the throne and prayer changes things. Hallelujah. That is why the enemy can't win. Okay, but he's going to try and he's going to do a whole lot of damage. And we see the damage that he does through this story played out in Judges 9. So let's continue. Hallelujah. And so we see that Jotham, the young brother who escaped, uh, he came and he, he gave a, a, a story on the top of Mount Gerizim. Now, the interesting thing about this was that Mount Gerizim was the mountain of blessing when the children of Israel came into the promised land and uh, six tribes stood on Mount Gerizim and six tribes stood on Mount Ebal. Mount Gerizim was the, tri was the mountain where the blessings were pronounced in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, while Mount Ebal was the mountain where the curses were announced. Um, but on Mount Gerizim, uh, the tribe of Joseph was on Mount Gerizim. And so Jotham, who was also of the tribe of Joseph, he's a uh, Gideon was from the tribe of Manasseh, and so uh, in Deuteronomy, it doesn't separate uh, Manasseh and Ephraim. It just says Joseph, So, uh, but Jotham is from Joseph because he's part of uh, Manasseh uh, because his father, Gideon, was from the tribe of Manasseh. So he goes to the same mountain where, he, where his ancestors once stood long ago. Uh, upon Mount Gerizim and pronounced, instead of a, a blessing, he pronounced a curse. He pronounced a curse upon the people of Shechem because they had done a, done a terrible thing by by uh, making um, Abimelech king and killing his 70 brothers. And so he says that because they've done this, um, uh, because they uh, put Abimelech over them, um, there's going to come a fire from Abimelech that's going to devour the leaders of Shechem and Beth Milo. And there's going to come a fire out from the leaders of Shechem and Beth Milo to devour Ab Abimelech. So uh, uh, the blessing has now become a curse. And so we uh, finish this uh, story. I, I, I can't go line by line because I got to finish this teaching. But verse 21, after he had finished the curse upon the people, um, Jotham ran away and fled and went to Beer and lived there because of Abimelech, his brother. So we still see that Jotham was protected. OK, uh, Jotham was protected. OK, uh, God protected him from the wrath of the enemy, who who is a representation of the Antichrist. And Jotham represents uh, uh, what well, his name means. The Lord is perfect and he represents the body of Christ. Hallelujah. And he also represents um, um, uh, the, the the Jews, well, the nation of Israel um, who will escape during a. Uh, when the abomination of desolation happens, okay, uh, uh, so it's a double, it's a double meaning, it's a, it's a double fulfillment of protection. Uh, Revelation 12 tells us that when the abomination of desolation happens, that um, the woman who gave birth to the man child will also escape uh, into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God, and this represents that time when Israel will escape those who are obedient to what Yeshua said to do. In Matthew 24, when they see the abomination, excuse me, of desolation. And so now here we get to um, uh, the end of Abimelech. But let's focus right here on verse 22. Abimelech ruled over Israel three years. Okay, so this represents the first half of the tribulation. Okay, this is a time of peace. Remember, when the Antichrist comes on the scene, he makes a covenant. Daniel 9, 27, the, the, the covenant of death. Okay, the covenant of death is made. And uh, it says here, and he shall make a strong covenant. Berit, berit, that's what covenant is in Hebrew. He shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. And for half of the week, he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. So, so, so for the first half, the first three and a half years, there's peace. Okay. Uh, just like it says here, Abimelech ruled over Israel three years. There's no problems, really. No problems while he first rules. But we see right here in Daniel, 
that in the middle of the week, he's going to put an end to the sacrifice and offering. Okay, he's going to allow the Jews to rebuild their temple and they're going to be able to offer sacrifices uh, uh, from the moment that is built. Uh, Daniel 8 tells us that from the moment that is built, um, the 2,300 day count will start. You can read that in Daniel 8. Um, so from the moment that the first offering is offered, the 2,300 days will count down from that day. But in the middle of that time, in the middle of the three and a half uh, years, the first three and a half years, the abomination is gonna, of desolation is going to happen. And the Antichrist is going to uh, annul the, the covenant of death. Okay, He's going to annul the covenant of death because it's, a, it's an agreement with hell. Okay, and we know that um, an agreement with hell uh, will not stand. Hallelujah! And so the Antichrist puts an end to the um, to the to the covenant that he signed with the many people, specifically the nation of Israel, and he's going to put the, the abomination that makes desolate. He's going to put the image of the beast up in there. He's going to sit on the throne, and he's going to declare himself that he's God. Okay, and he's going to tell everyone to. Um, take the mark, and uh, everyone who does not take the mark will be killed. And so we also see the covenant of death in Isaiah 28. Okay, and it's interesting that this uh, this story is also talking about Ephraim. Okay, the northern kingdom, which is what Judges 9 is is all about. This uh, this is a story focused on um, the tribe of Manasseh and Ephraim. Okay. Um, the tribe uh, 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 of uh, uh, the northern kingdom, uh, even though this is during the time of the judges. Hallelujah. Um, but here in Isaiah 28, um, I can't, I want to put everything together, but let me just, for sake of time, uh, go down to this covenant of death. Um, God says uh, that there's a cornerstone laid in Jerusalem. Hallelujah. And the cornerstone is, of course, uh, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Uh, but the people, uh, instead of accepting the cornerstone, they have made a, an agreement with death. Uh, verse 15, because you have said we have made a covenant with death, that's the Baal Berit, the Baal Berit, the Baal Berit, the covenant with death, okay, with the, with the, with the false god, the Antichrist, and with hell are we at agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us, for we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. So when they make this covenant of death, and when they make this agreement with hell, the Antichrist, uh, they believe that the overflowing scourge, <laughs> which, is the, uh, which is the lake of fire, uh, the overflowing scourge is the lake of fire, uh, it's, the, it's the final judgment. Uh, they don't believe that it's going to come to them. They, they've made the Antichrist their God. They have made an, the Antichrist their Messiah. Okay, and, and they've hidden themselves uh, under falsehood. They've, they've made the lies of the Antichrist their refuge. Okay, but God says, no way. There's a cornerstone that he's laid uh, as a foundation stone, which is Jesus Christ. He's the tried and precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Okay, um, he's the one who's going to annul uh, the covenant with death. OK, and the overflowing scourge will pass through. Hallelujah. And look what what he look at what the overflowing scourge says, uh, what, he, what he says after this agreement with death is uh, disannulled. Verse 18, and your covenant with death shall be disannulled. And your agreement with hell shall not stand when the overflowing scourge shall pass through. Then you shall be trodden down by it from the time that it goeth forth. It shall take you for morning by morning shall it pass over by day and by night, and it shall be a vexation only to understand the report. My goodness, this is the lake of fire. It's a vexation just to try to understand what God is talking about here. The overflowing scourge, that is the lake of fire. It's never ending. Morning by morning, it will pass over you. And by day and by night, okay, the, it's never ending. Okay, everyone who makes the covenant with death, everyone who who's in agreement with hell, everyone who takes the mark of the beast, everyone who says that the Antichrist is God, they're going to be taken by the overflowing scourge. The overflowing scourge is the lake of fire. It's a vexation just to understand the report. It's a terrible thing just to contemplate the, the eternality 
of the situation that people will find themselves in when they're cast alive into the lake of fire. Okay? But God's will is going to be done. Because man is stubborn. Man doesn't want to trust in the foundation stone, the tried and true stone, which is Jesus Christ. Well, they're going to make their covenant with death. And they're going to be beaten down by the overflowing scourge when it comes. Okay? Because this this reign of Abimelech is not going to last forever. And we see that Abimelech ruled over Israel for three years. Okay? And for the three years that he ruled, there was relative peace. But in the middle, after the three years, look what happened. Look what the Bible says. And then God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the leaders of Shechem. And the leaders of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech. So here we see the abomination of desolation. We see that God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the leaders of Shechem. And the leaders of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech. So now um, we see what's going to happen in the end times. So uh, let me just detour here real quick to paint this picture about the last seven years. In the book of Revelation, uh, the last seven years is likened to one hour, okay? Okay, so in Revelation 3.10, we read this. Because you have kept my word about patience and endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial, the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. So here, uh, God promises the church of Philadelphia that he's going to keep them from the hour of trial. This is the rapture. He's going to keep... Uh, his body uh, from the hour of trial. Okay, the hour of trial is the tribulation. So God likens the seven year tribulation to uh, an hour of trial. And because everything must be established out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, God repeats himself about the tribulation being likened to an hour. We read that in Revelation 17 12. Okay, we read this here. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. Okay, so we see that God again, he likens the seven-year tribulation to one hour. Okay, the one hour equals seven years. Okay, we know that um, the ten kings and the beast only take over after they destroy Babylon the Great, which happens on the cloudy day. And they take over once they sign the agreement, the covenant of death. Uh, everything that we just read in shadow form in Judges chapter 9. Remember that um, the ten kings are represented by uh, the leaders of, of Shechem, who gave Jerubbabel, I mean, uh, Abimelech, uh, they gave him the 70 pieces of silver. Okay? Uh, they, they, those represent the ten kings. Okay, and Abimelech represents the beast, the Antichrist. Okay, and they didn't receive their kingdom, they didn't receive their rulership until they had um, killed the 70 brothers of Abimelech. Okay, but and that represents um, what happens in our day. Um, once the 70 years are up, the judgment upon Babylon comes. Babylon is destroyed. Gog and Magog happens at the same time. The rapture of the church happens as well. All in one day, this day of sudden destruction. And then from the ashes, uh, the beast takes over with the ten kings. And for um, the hour uh, that they rule, it will be likened to um, seven years. It's the seven-year tribulation. Uh, hallelujah. So the hour of trial is the seven-year tribulation. Uh, the one hour that the beast and the ten kings rule is the seven-year tribulation. So why is this important? Well, this is important to understand because we can understand why there's a half hour of silence in heaven. In uh, Revelation chapter 8, we read this. When he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Okay, so... We see here when the seventh seal is open that there will be silence in heaven for about the space of half an hour. Why is there silence in heaven for half an hour? Well, first of all, we have to realize that the whole seven sealed scroll is open 
on the cloudy day. When Yeshua descends from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, the whole seven sealed scroll is open because the first four trumpets are also blown. Okay, the whole seven sealed scroll is manifested because the contents, the trumpets are also written inside the scroll as well as the bowls. So when Yeshua comes down from heaven, the whole scroll is open. That means that the first four seals, which which um, the first four seals are the four winds of heaven, they're released, the whirlwinds of the south, they're released. The fifth seal is um, the resurrection of the dead in Christ. Um, the, the sixth seal is uh, Yeshua coming, um, the cloudy day, he's coming, the wrath of the Lamb, okay? And then the seventh seal is related to uh, the first half of the tribulation, Okay, and at the same time, though, the first four trumpets are also blown. Um, when this, when the seven seal scroll is open, the first four trumpets are also blown in connection uh, of the cloudy day, because these first four trumpets, um, the first, when the first angel sounds, that's the hailstones, that's the hailstones, and the third of the earth is burnt up. Okay, that's the hailstones that come. Um, the second trumpet is is Babylon the Great being destroyed okay the great mountain burning with fire is babylon the great being thrown into the sea okay that's the, the destruction of babylon let me just show you this i, I got to show you how this is babylon uh babylon the great hallelujah um jeremiah 51 25 the destruction of babylon okay and here jeremiah uh, 51 25 um uh, God says that he's against um, Babylon the Great. Let's read this. Behold, I'm against you, O destroying mountain, saith the Lord, which destroyeth all the earth. And I will stretch out my hand upon you and roll you down from the rocks. He will make you a burnt mountain. Okay, so Babylon the Great is likened to a destroying mountain, and he's going to make it into a burnt mountain. Okay, Jeremiah chapter 51 is all about Babylon's punishment. Okay, so... We see in Revelation when the second trumpet, uh, when the second trumpet um, blows, Babylon the Great is uh, thrown into the sea. It's, it, it becomes a burnt mountain. Okay, the Great Mountain is Babylon the Great, destroyed by fire. Okay, and then we see uh, the third angel sound, which is um, a great star from heaven uh, falls to the earth. Okay, I believe that this is a um, the there's a lot to this, but I believe this is also representing repre representing uh, the fall of Satan, okay, when he's kicked out of heaven, okay, because that all happens on the same day. I can't go into the particulars, but maybe I'll do another teaching of, of how this is multi-layered, but this represents the fall of Satan when he comes down to the earth, okay? And then the fourth angel sounds is... Um, um, uh, when, all, when, when all the, you know, the... Uh, the stars of the heavens are darkened, okay, because of the cloudy day, okay, and so all these, all these four first four trumpets are blown uh, when the temple in heaven is open. Um, in verses three through five, we see how the temple in heaven is open. This is the temple in heaven opening. Um, the angel who has power over fire. I went over in my last teaching. That's Gabriel. He's doing the service. This is what opens the temple in heaven, and once the temple in heaven is open um all the all the elements come out first is yeshua he comes down on the clouds with michael the archangel who tells him to reap the harvest and then gabriel comes out the second angel he announces that babylon has fallen and at the same time the the, the winds are released the first four seals uh uh, when Yeshua reaps the harvest, the fifth seal uh, happens, the, the, the dead are raised first, uh, the sixth seal happens, uh, those who are alive are caught up, while those who are left behind uh, see the wrath of the Lamb, they try to hide in, in the caves and in the rocks, and the first four trumpets are blown, okay, there's noises and thunders and lightnings, and a great earthquake, and hailstones, and all, this is, this is all this, and the destruction of Babylon, it's all wrapped up in the same day. Okay, so praise the Lord, and because all this happens on the same day, 
once it's all over, there's silence in heaven for half an hour. Okay, and the, and the silence in heaven for half an hour represents the first half of the tribulation. The first half of the tribulation where there's peace on earth um, by the by the uh, by the Antichrist. Okay, that's why he rules. Um, Abimelech rules over Israel for three years. This represents uh, the silence in heaven because remember um, the church is taken out of the world and there's no more light. Heaven is silent during this time. Okay. Heaven is silent during the first three and a half years because the Bible tells us that the only light that will be coming during that time will be coming from the two witnesses. And the two witnesses are God's representatives on the earth. Okay. Uh, the two witnesses are given power by uh, by God to prophesy for a thousand two hundred and three score day clothed in sackcloth. And look at verse four. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. So they're the only lights that are on the earth at this time. During the first um, uh, three, uh, three and a half years, it's, it's only the two witnesses that are the lights of the world. That's why God gives them power to resist everyone who comes against them. No one can hurt them. No one can kill them. And they have all the power to uh, unleash all types of plagues on the earth during the first three and a half years. Okay, heaven is silent. Uh, the whole seven seal scroll and the first four trumpets were all blown on the day of sudden destruction. Okay, but then there's a lull. There's a lull uh, uh, during the first half of the tribulation. The fifth trumpet doesn't blow until uh, the middle of the tribulation. That is why um, Revelation 8 um, tells us that there's a, there's a law. At the end of Revelation, we read this. Revelation 8, we read this. Uh, then I looked, verse 13, Then I looked and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead. Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth at the blast of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. Okay, so there's a law between the first four trumpets and the last three trumpets. And that lull is because there's a half an hour of silence in heaven. Um, the half an hour of silence in heaven is that there's no, there's no one speaking from heaven. Okay, God is not moving at this time. The only people who are working on behalf of God at this time are the two witnesses. That is why uh, at the middle of the tribulation, when the two witnesses are killed, the bottomless pit is opened up. Okay, the, the, the two witnesses are killed by the one who ascends out of the bottomless pit. Okay, that's the fifth trumpet when the bottomless pit is opened up. Okay, the fifth trumpet sounds at the time when the two witnesses are killed, three and a half years into the tribulation. And the people rejoice. Okay, the people are rejoicing because the two witnesses are killed because they were the ones who, who were bringing all the destruction and all the torment upon the world during... Uh, the first three and a half years, okay? The first three and a half years was was typified by the peace of the Antichrist. But the only troubles, the only troublemakers, so to speak, were the two prophets of God, the, the, the two witnesses. That's why when they're killed by the beast who comes out of the bottomless pit, the earth rejoices, okay? Because it was because of the two witnesses that all the problems during the first three and a half years uh, were taking place on the earth because of them. Uh, because there was a half hour of silence in heaven. Nothing was going on in regards to judgments coming from heaven. The only judgments were coming from the two witnesses. Okay, so I hope that explained it. Now you can understand why there's a half hour of silence in heaven. And then we get back to the teaching in Judges 9, that um, after the three years, after the three years, then God speaks. Okay, so God begins to speak during the second half of the tribulation. Remember, there's a half an hour of silence in heaven, but the whole tribulation is likened to an hour. Okay, it's the hour of trial. So there's still another half hour left. And the, and the, the last half hour is the last 42 months. And the last 42 months is when the Antichrist um, um, issues the mark of the beast because he declares himself to be God. He commits the abomination of desolation. Uh, the, because the evil spirit comes. The evil spirit comes and the dragon and the false prophet and they just wreak havoc on the earth. It's called 
uh, the time of a great tribulation. No time like it in human history. And it's a time of great destruction because the Antichrist will be hell-bent upon killing everyone who will not worship him. And um, we see the same type and shadow being played out in Judges 9 when God sent an evil spirit after the first half of the tribulation. Okay, I hope you're, hope you're getting that picture. And so uh, we also see that there's wars fought against uh, Abimelech, and we see that uh, even the false prophet is, is mentioned in a shadow. Um, the false prophet is mentioned in a shadow. Um, the false prophet's name is Zebul, okay? Um, Gaul uh, was the son of Ebed who, who stirred up the people to rebel against Abimelech. And he, they had a drunken feast during, uh, uh, during the time of the grape harvest. And during the time of the grape harvest was when um, Abimelech's overthrow was, was planned and plotted. And we read in verse 28, And Gaul, the son of Ebed, said, Who is Abimelech, and who are we of Shechem, that we should serve him? Is he not the son of Jerubbabel, and is not Zebul his officer? Serve the men of Hamar, the father of Shechem. But why should we serve him? Okay, so we see the false prophet is Zebul. This is a, Zebul is the officer of Abimelech. So in a shadow, Zebul is the false prophet. Okay, the false prophet is Zebul in this story. Abimelech is the Antichrist. Zebul is the false prophet. Okay, uh, they're, they're working hand in hand. And the interesting thing about the name Zebul is me, it means to dwell. Uh, let me show you this right quick. Zebul. Zebul means uh, to dwell in Hebrew. An officer of Abimelech. It comes from the root word Zabal. Okay? Dwell. Okay? Dwell. So, just like in Revelation, uh, the false prophet and the Antichrist dwell together in the end times. And for all eternity, they will also dwell in the lake of fire. Hallelujah. They, they will be the first occupants of the lake of fire a thousand years before anyone else, even before the devil himself. Um, the false prophet and uh, the Antichrist, they dwell together in the end times, and then they will dwell in the lake of fire together for all eternity. And so um, we also see that um, the overthrow was plotted during the grape harvest, which represents the time when Yeshua will come again. Um, we read in verse 27, And they went out into the field and gathered the grapes from their vineyards, and trod them, and held a festival. And they went into the house of their god, and ate and drank, and reviled Abimelech. So Abimelech's overthrow happens during the time of the grape harvest, which correlates to when Yeshua will come again. And he will trample um, the wine press. Um, he will stain all his raiment, according to Isaiah 63. Isaiah 63 tells us this. Isaiah 63 says, uh, uh, verse 3, Well, verse 2, Why is your apparel red and your garments like his who treads in the winepress? Okay, I have trod in the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. Their lifeblood splattered on my garments and stained all my apparel. For the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption had come. Okay, so this is Yeshua coming again. And he's going to trod the, the, the wine press of the fierceness of, and wrath of God. Okay. It comes during the fall season because uh, the last uh, three fall festivals will be fulfilled. Okay. The last three fall festivals will be fulfilled, which is um, uh, trumpets, Yom Kippur, and tabernacles. And that's at the time of the grape harvest. And so we see this right here when Yeshua comes again. He's going to trample um, upon uh, all those who who uh, uh, are are gathered together with the Bimelech and the false prophet. We read in verse 15 when he comes, and out of his mouth goeth the sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Okay, so the winepress. Okay, the grape harvest. Okay, 
uh, the grape harvest, the time of, uh, of the harvest. Okay, there's three harvests. Uh, Christ was the first fruits, which represented the barley harvest. Uh, the order of the resurrection will continue with uh, the wheat harvest, which is the church, the body of Christ. Uh, the man child will be caught up and unto God and to his throne. And then the gleanings of the field, uh, the olives, the, 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 uh, the wine press, uh, the grapes. Uh, represents those who who will be raptured or are resurrected um, when Yeshua comes again at the Battle of Armageddon. But uh, all those who are left behind who will not uh, come to him, well, they're the grapes of wrath. And he's going to trot all the grapes that have the mark of the beast and who worship the Antichrist by making the covenant of death. Okay, so I hope that was clear. Uh, praise the Lord. I'm almost done. Um, here we see that there were four four battles fought. And we know that in the time of the end, um, once the tribulation, the great tribulation begins, uh, the two final great wars are, are, will be fought. Okay, the sixth trumpet tells us that uh, the kings of the east will come. and they will make war against uh, uh, the Antichrist. And we read about uh, the outcome in Daniel 11, 44. Uh, the Antichrist, he hears news from the east and from the north, uh, and it's going to alarm him. But he shall go out with great fury to destroy and devote many to destruction. Okay, we, that's the sixth trumpet. When the sixth trumpet sounds, um, uh, uh, the kings from the east come. And the kings from the east come, and the Bible says uh, that one-third of all mankind will die. Um, one-third of all mankind will die when this happens. Okay, the kings from the east are going to come when the sixth trumpet sounds. And so uh, when the four angels who were prepared for an hour, the day, and the month, and the year were released, they're going to kill a third of mankind. Okay, this is the great war, uh, which is um, shadowed. In the wars that Abimelech fought once the evil spirit came, uh, the last half of the tribulation, um, uh, Abimelech made war and he was successful uh, uh, with the first with the first three. He was successful, um, and the Antichrist he will be successful, um, like Daniel eleven tells us. He's going to annihilate many when he hears the trouble that comes from the north and the east. When the sixth trumpet sounds, he's going to win this war. OK, but the Bible says one third of all mankind will die. All those who are left at that point in time. OK, remember, this is the second half of the tribulation. This is when you when people have the mark of the beast. And and this is when, you know, this just, you know, it's just a terrible day. You don't even want to see it. This is this is the last stand of the enemy. OK, uh, but then there is one more war left to be fought. And of course, that war is Armageddon. OK, Armageddon is the final war and um when the final war is fought um god is going to come on the white horse okay and we see that happen in the shadow when abimelech his final war he he came to this tower um at thebes and a woman um got to the top of the tower and abimelech went to try to set the tower on fire but a certain woman, verse 53, threw a upper millstone on Abimelech's head and crushed his skull. Okay, and so this represents the stone, uh, the rock, the chief cornerstone that will come at the Battle of Armageddon and crush um, the head of the serpent. Okay, the Antichrist and the false prophet. He kills, he kills everyone who are gathered together at the Battle of Armageddon with the brightness of his coming and with the word of his mouth. He is the stone. He is the rock that comes and crushes the head. And the woman is with him. Okay, the woman is uh, the bride of Christ. We're with him. So it's a perfect picture of the end times. Okay, a perfect picture of the end times. And um, this story in Judges 9, I pray that you would read it for yourself, um, that you would go line upon line and draw out more because there's more in here. I would just 
hitting the high points. And I didn't think it was going to take an hour, but I, I've been speaking for an hour. I didn't really want to make a video this long, but praise God that uh, we got through it. I hope this was edifying. I hope that you saw the connections. I hope that God was speaking to you through this teaching. I hope that you uh, can apply what you've learned and that you can share with others because the time is short. Everything is about to happen. 70 years are here. Okay, the 70th week is upon us. The church is about to be raptured out of the world. And once that day comes, you don't want to be left behind. You want to be caught up in the rapture. Give your heart and your life to Jesus Christ. Accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Don't get left behind to see the covenant of death. Don't get left behind to see the face of the serpent. Because much deception is going to be on the earth in that day. Okay? A strong delusion is going to be sent, God says, in that day. That people will believe the lie. Okay? Because they had no love for the truth. You don't want to be caught up in that lie, which will be manifested after the cloudy day. Come to Jesus. Confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. Believe in your heart that he rose from the dead, and you shall be saved. That's it. That's all. I love you. God bless you. Shalom. Amen.